So I'll be covering, uh, again, advanced strength of materials scores. We're covering um, the applications of elasticity equations as they apply to rotating disk and flywheels. And there's some very cool things you can do with this analysis that you cannot do with finite elements in a very straightforward way, which is why this material is good to learn. And one thing I want to point out is that um, these equations are very helpful for a lot of different problems where you have rotating machinery, uh, and that applies to rocket engines, uh, you know, aircraft engines, and things like that. Uh, I want to summarize one more time, and I've been doing that every lecture, but I want these to really become part of what your brain is thinking about so that it's kind of ingrained in you what, what you're trying to achieve here, right? So what, what is the end goal of what we're trying to achieve? The end goal is that I can design an aircraft. Uh, if you're not into aerospace designs, maybe mechanical engineering design, um, automotive. Um, my degree was in mechanical engineering, so I did a lot of stuff um, for that. But now I'm aerospace, so I kind of like both actually, automotive particularly. But you can apply these ideas to design systems so they don't fail. That's the whole point, right? And we learned that every system that's going to fail is going to fail because perhaps, perhaps, and I'll cover that a little bit er later today in the practical session, that perhaps the failure occurs when the stress of the material exceeds the strength of the material. And that's a material property you can test in the labs. So that's that's really when failure could occur, one of the failure modes that could occur. Uh, and to be able to tackle that problem, we covered how these equations here that you see on this screen in this particular slide are helpful in trying to figure out when the structure fails and how and where. So what are the equations that matter here then? So these are the three governing equations that we derived using Newton's law. Uh, F equals ma, force equals mass times acceleration. And we learned that these equations are for a body that deforms. Uh, and here, no dynamic terms were uh, included, but we do have three body forces. The body force in the x direction the body force in the y direction, and the body force in the z direction. The body force is a force quantity that acts on, at every point of the body of the material. One example is gravity. So gravity acts at every point of the material, right? So uh, an, a phone, for example, subjected to the three Gs, is likely going to have gravitational laws acting at every single point in this body of material. Um, you also have six strain um, displacement relationships, and these relationships describe the deformations of the system and also provide you an ability to connect it to the strains with, which measure the relative deformation of the system. For example, an aircraft wing, when it's tested, the wing moves upwards of 25 feet to 35 feet. Well, we know that the wing tip is not where it fails, although it's the area that moves the most. The area that usually fails the most is where it's highly strained. And that area tends to be the, the wing root where it's connected to the fuselage, as an example. Um, and so strain makes more sense for us to look at that. Now, there's a lot of different applications where deflections are extremely important to figure out what they are. An example will be a liquid rocket engine where the turbine blade is rotating at fa fast speeds. We'll be talking about that, about that today. Um, that tip of the blade of that turbine wheel, we don't want that to touch the casing. So you need a clearance there. And that's where the deflection can be a very valuable quantity to understand. And then we learned that can relate the stress, relate the stress, noting that the stress is a internal force quantity inside of the body resisting external loads. That stress can be related to strains using the constitutive relationships which are empirical relationships that can be completely defined through testing using an MTS machine, um, you know, basically a test machine that can really fully characterize the young modulus, the Poisson ratio, the shear modulus. We cover some of those things. And what we found is that there's 15 equations, 15 unknowns. We also learned that the stress is symmetric and is symmetric because of the moment of momentum equations. That's also something we learned as well. But I do have 15 equations, 15 unknowns, and typically we don't do these 
solving these things by hand because solving, you know, basically modeling a whole aircraft using hand calculations would be almost impossible. However, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give in this course specific examples where it's actually extremely valuable to have those hand calculations because building a model will take much longer, number one. Number two, if you can program some of these, some of these equations ahead of time, it can be very helpful because you can then use that tool to solve problems and size, size your design. And number three, there are situations where finite elements is just not, it is great to get loads, but the level of definition you need with the computational capabilities you have today may not be the best tool. As an example, I have rivet holes or I have holes within the, uh, within the fuselage. Well, modeling every single little hole in the aircraft in your final model is impractical. But if I can get the stress field surrounding that hole, maybe that's better because I can plug that in into a hand calculation, which I can then use to size the design. Does that make sense to you? Great. So we'll cover some examples where it's practical for you to use those hand calculations. So I'll teach you that balance where finite elements is useful and the balance where maybe a hand calculation is useful. We also learned that what produces stress in the material is external loads acting in the body of the material. So for example, you have the wing of an aircraft, and I keep bringing up the wing because that's sort of the things that work, or let's change it to la launch rocket. You have a, a basically a launch vehicle that's gonna take off to space. Well, guess what? The loading environments that's gonna experience are gonna come from the angle of attack of that launch vehicle relative to the wind direction. Well, that's gonna cause vehicle bending. It's gonna cause you know stresses in the wall. The tanks are pressurized, so that's gonna create pressure inside the tanks, um, which is gonna cause the vehicle to stress, plus the bending, plus the torsion. You have all these loads acting on a launch vehicle, and you need to size that appropriately. Those loads that are acting on the vehicle are external loads acting on the surface of the, of the vehicle. Even the pressure acting inside the tank is a, pressure, is a loading condition acting on the surface of the inside of the tank. So every load you can apply that you can think of, those loads are going to be loads you can apply on the surface of the material. The only forces you can apply at every point in the volume of the material are things like gravity, as an example. We also learned the map. The map of, and this coming from my book, is a map that discusses how you go from external loads all the way to displacement, strains, stresses, and internal loads. All these things are interconnected through these equations right here. So then I go then, uh, so the ones I showed you here are for Cartesian coordinate system. Uh, the equations can be conveniently written in polar coordinate systems. And that's useful for problems where you have cylindrical type uh, structures. For example, a pressure vessel is cylindrical, so polar coordinate, coordinates makes the most sense. If you have a shaft that's rotating, then a polar coordinate makes sense. What you see here, however, is some interesting terms that came up, one over R and R, and you don't see that in the Cartesian coordinate system. This derivation of going from Cartesian to polar coordinate is definitely a very simple and uh, straightforward uh, derivation. All we did here is to transform X to the Cartesian system to the polar coordinate system using transformation rules. For example, x equals the radius times cosine theta, for example, and y equals r times sine theta. I did not provide the derivations here because they're in the book, but uh, I'm just trying to explain where this one over r comes from. And in this equation, you also note an fr and f theta, which today we'll be using. I did not use that in the previous lecture when I covered pressure vessels. Um, the other thing uh, here that's going to come up is FR is a body force. Now let's think about what that FR is. So FR here is a radial component of stress or, or radial component of force that's acting on that um, at every point of the body, okay? Um, F theta is the theta component of the body force. And today for the first time, we'll see one of these components show up. The strain deflection relationship as you can see here, that's for Cartesian system here, right there. 
And, and remember, these epsilon xx, epsilon yy, and epsilon zz are, are strings that are directional strings that cause a, a cube that's originally undeformed to stretch or contract in three different directions, while the other three strings are acting to distort the cube and the angle change as a consequence. So those other three strings are measuring the angle change. Well, when you bring the polar coordinate system, the strains that only uh, we're talking about here um, are going to be the radial strain, which causes straining in the radial direction, epsilon theta theta, which is a hoop strain, and that's a strain acting in the circumferential direction. So just to give you a feel for that, uh, I'll draw a circle here, kind of illustrate it for you. Uh, so you have the radial direction is that way, R, and then the theta direction is that way, like that. And then this component of strain, which is shear strain, epsilon R theta, is measuring the angle change here, um, the angle between the radial direction and the theta direction. So uh, let's consider rotating disk. It's a very important problem that's encountered in a lot of automotive applications. And fatigue failure mode is actually one of the areas of concern when it comes to rotating shafts. Uh, well, why? Because what really happens there is that you have a shaft under, under a, uh, say, some amount of rotational speed, say some RPMs, revolutions per minute of some kind, right? Like your car or whatever. Well, that's going to cause the, spin, the, the disc to spin or the shaft to spin. That's going to produce a body force. But what really happens in real life is that you don't only have the body force. You have imbalances in the shaft from manufacturing, or you have parts that are manufactured on the shaft that'll cause the shaft to vibrate a little bit. And that oscillatory nature is going to potentially uh, superimpose with a shaft loading condition uh, of, the, of the rotational speed. That two together could cause the shaft to fail due to fatigue loading. And so that's one of the areas that, that are, is important to estimate the stresses within a shaft due to centri centrifugal forces. So what is a new term that show, shows up in my equilibrium equations? Well, I told you that I have this FR term. I also discussed with you that we're going to, um, if you give me a second, uh, we also discussed that we're going to uh, say that for a rotational problem, um, or cylindrical system where you have axis symmetry, uh, that this term can go to zero, the shear stress, because this term will go to zero, because we're removing any, any dependencies against theta. That's go to zero. We say that there is no deflection in the theta direction, so that's zero, and that's zero. But this is connected to that because sigma r theta equals g times twice epsilon r theta. I've been using also gamma for that. Since this is zero, that's also zero. And so uh, in reality, and this looks very messy, but I, th I think you get the point. Uh, basically, you end up with this term going away, and things actually simplify quite a bit, and they simplify to this point. With, you only get one equation that's the one that matters. For in polar coordinate systems, for this particular application, for another application, it could be that all equations are necessary. But for this particular problem, this equation is what we need to use. Now, in a lot of these problems, what, what I've been doing, though, as you, you can see so far, I've been deriving the equations for you. Now, I, I'm asking you to learn about how I derived it, but I'm not asking you to memorize it because I'm not going to ask you to derive anything. Uh, what I want you to learn to do is how to apply the equations. But I don't want you to just apply the equations without knowing where they come from, because otherwise you're just using them without knowing where they come from. And so I think it's important to know where they come from. Is that clear, that point? Okay, so uh, with that said, I do have a question that I wanna take. So we have a uh, density of the material, which is important. Um, the radius R, that R there is a coordinate of the system. And then omega is the speed at which your this disc is rotating. Okay, so that's what's going on here. So it's the same procedure as before, nothing different. This is the equation of motion for this particular system. Notice how this FR is rho r omega squared. And that 
rho r mega squared is acting towards the center of the disk. That's an important consideration to keep in mind as you're looking to this. And that's why that's a far, as I had discussed uh, earlier. So that right there is your AFR that I had in the previous slide. That's the body force here uh, that's acting. You agree that when this is spinning at high speeds, every point here sees that. Every point sees that centrifugal motion. Every point here sees, well, all the points that drew outside the disk is air, so not really. But uh, every point in the disk is experiencing that centrifugal load. And so that's why that's a body force. Okay. Now my next step is to think about the bigger picture one, what I'm trying to accomplish. What I'm trying to accomplish, I'm trying to figure out how to solve this problem of a spinning disk and what are the stresses here. Now when you look at these equations, I'm kind of stuck. I think everybody agrees here that I have two unknowns and one equation. So I'm kind of stuck. I have to do more. And so that's where I will go in. And I already covered this, that these terms go away, this term goes away, this term goes away, that term goes away, and all these terms will go away. And so that we arrive to where we arrive. But I can apply Hooke's law. So that's my next step. I can connect the stresses to strain, right? So when I look at my map here, right? I start here from stresses. I start from stresses. I go to strains using the constitutive law. Then I go to displacements using the strain deflection relationships, right? That's kind of how I'm going, right? So when I look at what I have in my particular problem statement, I notice that I only have one equation here, but two unknowns. Well, what's going to rescue me now because I'm kind of stuck, right? So the next step is stress-strain relationship. That's your constitutive law. That's these relationships here. Well, equation number one and equation number two. And these relationships come, this one right here particularly, look at this one only for now, this one in square, in rectangle here, that's the one that comes from experiments. You measure that, you can determine what the Young modulus is, is and the Poisson ratio is using experiments. And then from there, you can plug in the displacement relationships, that's that. And you know what epsilon r is, you know what epsilon theta is, I know all that stuff. And so because I know all that stuff, now my stresses are written in terms of deflections, which is very helpful because now check this out. When I plug these equations into here, look at that beauty. Everything is in one unknown and I only have one equation. So again, l let me clear this up so that it is kind of, you know, a lot of ink on the slide can be painful sometimes to your eyes. One more time. Equation number one is here. Two unknowns, one equation. That sucks. Let me use this here then. I have the stress strain relationship. Step two. And then I can plug in the strains for deflections. Step three. Where did that come from? I already taught you where that come from. That comes from here. This 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 relationship's here. That's where it comes from. And now that I have everything in terms of deflections, boom, everything in terms of deflection there. One equation, one unknown, which is deflection. Any question so far on what, what I covered there? Very straightforward. Now I have, and this looks almost the same as what I have last week in the previous lecture, I apologize, for pressure vessels. So when I had a pressure vessel, it was the same equations. The difference is the pressure vessel is not rotating. So omega was zero. So the equation actually looks the same as last, the last lecture where I was covering pressure vessels, but this time omega is zero in this case. So in that case, uh, I now when I summarize here, uh, let me take this next question here, if I can uh, make this happen. So let me go back to explain what that is. So here, U, that U here, that you see in the bottom right equation, that's a radial deflection. So, so if it was not clear, I apologize for that. But let me draw it one more time for you so everybody has it clear in your heads. If this is a circle or the polar coordinate system, this is the radial direction 
and that's the theta direction. According to the notes in my lecture notes, these deflections you are or you alone in some, in some books. In some other books, you're going to find that this tangential deflection is going to be u theta, but in my notes here I have v. And that's why you see uh, the strain deflection relationship here uh, being written as u sub r and u sub theta. All the later on, I switch to u and v. I apologize for that confusion. So now that I have my differential equation, that's my differential equation here at the top. I don't have to learn uh, how to solve differential equations. Well, I, you should, all right, I mean, let me rectify what I said there. You have to learn it, but for this particular class, uh, you, you, you don't have to have that knowledge because you can use Wolfram Alpha, or I am assuming the chat IGB, one of those codes out there, AI machines, you tell them, okay, you're driving, say, right? You're driving. And you tell the, 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 the car computer, hey, I'm driving and there's a lot of traffic. Can you help me solve this differential equation? You, you, you read it. Okay, partial, second derivative of u respect to r squared, blah, 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 you say, okay? And then the machine will tell you back, okay, the solution is u equals c1 times r plus c2, 1 over r plus blah, 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 blah. So you get the solution. Now, you should know how to do this because, you know, that's part of your education here. But for this lecture or this uh, course, it's not necessary to memorize how to solve a differential equation. Although I do expect each of you to know how to do that. So the, because I have two, but I do expect you to know at least this part, uh, that I have two uh, derivatives on u. So when I do my solution or I solve for you, I should get two constants of integration, C1 and C2. And that should be very apparent to you. Now, the question becomes, well, how, how do I find C1 and C2? How do I find that? And the answer is, usually, for any problem that you work on, on differential equations, the way you solve for C1 and C2, the constants of integration, which is what it's called, any problem you encounter, say thermal, fluid, structure, I don't care what area of expertise, for most areas of expertise, the constants of integration will come from the boundary conditions. That's where they come from. And so for this problem, you can see, you, you, we know what the boundary conditions are. And I'll cover what those are in a second. Uh, however, I want to recast, and that's a fair thing to do. Uh, I can recast my constants of integration any way I want. Uh, and to follow book convention, I'll be using how they recasted it. You can solve it the way it's solved here, no problem. But I want to point out how it was done in this particular book, which I actually kind of like. So they rewrote C2 in this manner, and they wrote C1 in that manner. Now the constants of integration are still there. You don't know what A is, and you don't know what C is. Doesn't matter. It's still unknowns. They just wrote it differently, and it doesn't really matter how you do it. Uh, but it was rewritten in that way. Any, I'll, I'll pause there because I think it can be confusing to see that. Uh, any questions there? So the differential equation is this. The general equation, and let me make sure I have the laser working so you guys can see what I'm pointing to. So that's your differential equation there. That's your general solution with the two constants of integration not known. And then these two constants of integration, uh, by Plugging this into the general solution here, it just gives you the same equation I had above, but written differently, where A and C is unknown now, instead of C1 and C2. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. Okay, so I'm here now, and I'm wondering where to go next. Well, I know the deflections now. I don't know how to find the constants of integration, but I know I have boundary conditions, so perhaps I can use that fact. The strains can now be easily found because I know that the strains are related to deflections in this way. And I know what U is. Re remember, U is a radial deflection, which is also U sub R. I'm using that interchangeably. Um, so I know this is the case. So what, what if we plug that in here and see what happens? So that's what I did. Uh, I plugged it in there. So I took the radial deflection, which is in terms of A and C, and plugged it into UR. Uh, to get the strain in the radial direction and the strain in the hoop direction. 
And when you do that, you get these equations here, uh, which is interesting, but I'm kind of stuck still. I don't know what to do about the fact that I have two constants of integration. So let's just keep exploring this a little more. Let's connect that to stresses back again. So go back to stresses then to see if there's something there that can leverage. I did that here and you can see that um, I know I know the str uh, strains now. These strains are known in terms of deflections with the constants that are unknown, A. Uh, R is a radial coordinate. So R can take values of zero in the center of that disk all the way out to the edge where R equals A or B, whatever variable you want to use. So I know that, that the strain depends on that radius, R. And A and C is unknown. No is the Poisson ratio, E is a modulus. But again, I don't know what to do there. So what I'll do then is plug in those strains back in here and write, write in terms of deflection, plug in the deflection here. And when I do that, I get that the stresses for the rotating disk simplify to this. Uh, so very interesting there that the stresses simplify to that. Um, so what do I do now, right? Uh, Okay. What you can see here is that the stress, what is happening in the stress in the center of the rotating disk, if R equals zero. What is happening, think about that, when R tends to zero, what happens to that stress? Stress approaches what? Infinity, right? But that doesn't make sense that the stress will be infinity, right? It doesn't really make a lot of sense that stress will go to infinity. Not to me. If R goes to zero, then the stress shouldn't go to infinity. And because stress shouldn't go to infinity, obviously, okay, you may ask me why, why stress cannot go to infinity. Well, let me ask you this. If I rotate my little cell phone, do you see my the center of the cell phone blowing up right now? No. So obviously the stress doesn't go to infinity, right? I'm rotating at a point one. I don't know how fast, okay? Somebody can tell me, but I'm, Am I rotating this slowly? Is the cell phone blowing up? No, so that stress is not going to infinity. It will never will. So in this case, what does A need to be for that not to ever happen? That's your only option. A has to be zero. So now I'm able to impose one of the binary conditions. Very helpful there. So for the solid disk, A must be zero. You answered it correctly. Uh, who answered that? You get 10 points towards your homework. Well done. So A has to be zero, okay? But because A is zero, oh, let me make a note, no, okay. So C, the constant of integration C is then obtained from the binary condition. Uh, well, I know the following fact. Let me draw it for you so you can see what is going on there. That is a circle or not the circle, I apologize, the solid disk, this rotating at an omega. But when I look at sigma RR there, is there any, and if this was B, like say this R is B, at that particular surface, in that surface right there that encloses a solid disk, is there any tractions applied to that surface? Are there any tractions applied to that? Who said no? You know what I'm talking about. Uh, so sigma RR is what then? Zero. So sigma RR at B is zero. What do I do now? I have one constant that I don't know, which is C. I can solve for C very easily. I know Poisson ratio. I know the density. I know omega, the, the, the speed of rotation. I know R, which is B, because I'm looking at the surface. So I can solve for C very easily out of that equation. And what I do and plug in the fact that A is zero, and I plug in what C is without boring into details, what you find is that the stresses look like this. Sigma RR is this whole thing. Sigma theta is this whole thing. And the deflection is this whole thing. Now, when you look at this, 
you, you wonder, well, don't I, I feel like I have a lot of constants that I know. No, you know all this. You know the density of the material, rho. You know the speed of rotation, omega. You know the radius of the solid disk, which is B. And you know, and you plot against R, which varies. If you want to know what it is at R equals B half, you can check it. When you check, actually, let's check it now. When R is zero at the center of the disk, that's the stress. In fact, let's look at the radial stress at the surface of that disk. When R equals B, what happens to this term? It goes to zero. So the radial stress is zero out there in the edge of that solid disk, but it's very high at the center of that disk, which is counterintuitive to you because we discussed how the radial body force was moving outwards. Sigma theta theta as well can be also examined. So check this out. When r equals zero, you can see how at r equals zero, sigma rr equals sigma theta theta, which is quite interesting. Uh, that is telling us that the radial stress and the tangential stress is the same at r equals zero at the center. But at r equals b, the value is different. Um, and I'll plot that for you in a second. So very interesting ideas going on here. Uh, I plotted it here, you can see, and this is non-dimensional for Poisson ratio 0.3, normalized by rho omega squared a squared for each of them. And you can see how the stress, the radial stress, starts at a dimensional stress of 0.4. It's dimensionless because I, I wrote it so that it's normalized against rho omega squared a squared. So what I mean with that is I took rho, I took this and put it in the bottom denominator, I put omega squared to the denominator, and I also found a way of putting, yeah, that's what I did. And so when you do that, uh, you can write this in a very nice way. Um, okay, here you see A, A here is a radius of the disk, uh, while earlier in the previous slide, B was the radius of the disk. It doesn't matter, at the end of the day, we're talking about the same thing. Uh, there is a question here. That's, so, so the question is, what is U? U is a radial deflection, question number one. So that's a point, how much a point moves radially out. And the second question, in case it was not clear, the second question in the room was, when you're studying a problem, say a, a car or a wrench or an airplane that's flying, the boundary condition is not obvious. And that's where enduring, enduring judgment has to come into play. As an example, I want to study the wing. Well, we know the wing is going to deflect relative to the fuselage. Well, what you could do is model part of the fuselage and keep the wing fixed in that way because we know it's going to move relative to the fuselage since the fuselage is relatively stiff in the area where you're studying. For example, in the fuselage problem, the wing is not attached to the pressure vessel by itself necessarily, but it's usually attached to the center fuel section, which is a very rigid body. So it depends what you're studying, right? So now pick a cylinder, right? A cylinder um, that is flying in there. How do I analyze that? Well, that's a good question. You can analyze it. And in fact, I'll give you a problem where we're going to do that. Uh, usually, when you look at a mechanics materials problem, they give you a beam, beam that's pin pin. But what do you do in a situation where the beam is free free and it's flying? What do you do there? We'll do a problem like that to kind of give you a perspective on how that can be applied. But you're 100% right, 500% right, that finding boundary conditions for problems that are tricky is not clear sometimes. And I actually struggle with that many different times. It's a lot more clear in some of the areas of expertise like thermal or heat transfer problems where you know the ambient temperature. But even problems like that can be very hard because you may not know the convective coefficient of heat transfer. So even for those problems can be very complex, uh, but you have to make some, some assumptions. And that's why analysis is so important. You can test, and, and let me give you a little spiel about that. You can test all you want on the ground, and that's great. There's a reason why you test, and there's a reason why you analyze. And the reason you test is because you need to validate your model. And the reason you need a model is because what you fly is not how you test it. For example, when I test it, I'm going to test on the ground, but I'm testing something on the ground that's supposed to be flying, right? So for that reason, I need my model because my model is my transfer function 
between the flight conditions and the ground conditions. And so I need to make sure my model is accurate. And how do I do that? I take my test article on the ground, that wing or that pressure vessel, I'll instrument it using digital image correlation or strain gauges. I can use that and then compare that to my model where I made the assumptions on boundary conditions. And I do that comparison and I build confidence in my model, which is going to then help me figure out if the test that I actually did is even useful. Because the test has to envelope all the potential conditions you're going to see in flight. So hopefully that answers the question. It's more in the practical side, but that's really what we encounter. Okay, uh, one more question here. Let's take that. That's a great question. So you're going to have to do either plane stress or plane strain. If it's very long, you will use plane strain constitutive law. If it's very thin, it will be a plane stress problem. And so plane stress is one where the stresses through the thickness do not develop very much. Uh, and so that's basically your engineering assumption of what's the right thing to do for that simplification. Uh, but in reality, that's why you test also is to reevaluate your assumptions. Okay, so when I plot it here, you can see how the stresses, both the radial stress and the hoop stress, which is a stress tangential to the solid disk, the hoop stress, those two stresses are the same at the center of the disk. And then they depart from each other as you move away from the disk to the edge of the disk. You can see that the radial stress, radial stress drops where the, rid, the circumferential stress drops to about half of the initial value. So that's what's going on there when you look at this plot. I'll pause a couple of seconds here to make sure you can, you can follow this plot. If there's no questions, I'll proceed. Okay, so, so just to clarify, this is a solid disk. This is a radial coordinate R. That's the tangential coordinate theta. So sigma RR right there is going in that direction. And then that sigma theta there is going in the theta direction that you can see there. Okay. So let's move to the next slide here and study the hollow disk, which is not the same thing as a solid disk. And I'm building upon something that we're gonna see in a second, but a solid disk is a little bit different in nature than a hollow disk. In a hollow disk, the disk must have a radial stress of zero at R equals A, because now what I'm looking at, I'm looking at a disk, a, a, a hollow disk like this, right? Where R equals A is the inner diameter and R equals B is the outer diameter. R equals A is the inner diameter, R equals B is the outer diameter. So that's my solid hollow disk. And what I note, what I note is that in this case, I'm not looking at R equals zero, right? Why, why not interested in R equals zero? Anybody knows why we're not looking at R equals zero? There's nothing there. You know what I'm talking about. You get points. Uh, so R equals zero, there's nothing going on there. So I'm not looking at that. I'm looking at R equals A. And at R equals A, there's no traction force applied. There's no traction force applied. So the stress there has to be zero at R equals A. Is that clear? It's a free binary condition in this case. And so now I basically have two binary conditions. I have sigma RR is zero at R equals A, the inner diameter, and R equals B in the outer diameter. So I can solve for A and C very easily. Very easily, I can solve for A and C. Once I solve for A and C, I can get the stresses and deflections in the in the hollow disk straightforward because I know A and C. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's a plug and play here at this point. You may ask, well, I see a lot of constants again. What do I do? Well, no worries. You know nu is a Poisson ratio. You know the density. You know how much the disk is rotating. You know the inner diameter. You know the outer diameter. The radius uh, obviously varies upon where you're looking at the hollow disk. 
that's not a great disc that drove, but you get my point. Um, and that's how you deal with that. And the question becomes why the question, there's a question, and the question is why there is no stress in the boundary. So let's, let's cover that one more time to make sure that concept is clear to all of us here. So here's the disc again. I'll draw it one more time. That's R. If I look at sigma RR, and there's a sigma RR here, this surface two, on those two surfaces, the track, the, the vector normal to that surface is one zero zero in the polar coordinate system because that component is the in the radial direction. The traction is zero. I'm not applying anything there. In the Cauchy's relationship, if I multiply that, you will find that the sigma RR is zero at those two surfaces here. And here, it has to be because there's no traction loss applied. Let me plot that. So earlier, I, I got a number, uh, but it turns out that for hollow disk is very strange, very strange, but a hollow disk has two times the stress of a solid disk. Um, and you can see here how sigma RR start to zero like it should be and ends at zero like it should be. But the hoop stress is higher there and it drops to about a fourth at the bottom there. That's something that will be cool to point out. Very weird, but it is the way it is. Okay, with that said, uh, let's move to the design of a flywheel next.